This planet is often called the jewel of the solar system, probably because of how beautiful it is and how exotic it looks with colorful rings surrounding it. You've probably already guessed that I'm talking about Saturn, the second largest planet in the solar system. And the question is, can Saturn be a failed star? Now, a failed star is composed of gas, but it can't sustain nuclear fusion reactions in its core because it's not massive enough. This type of star is often referred to as a brown dwarf. Such space bodies are close in size to Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system. But brown dwarfs have a much greater mass. Unlike other stars, they don't emit a lot of visible light since they aren't large enough to fuse hydrogen, even though brown dwarfs can fuse deuterium with lithium. Failed stars were discovered around 60 years ago. Some of the first theoretical papers describing them were published in 1962. If we talk about the first time astronomers confirmed the existence of a brown dwarf, it happened in 1988 when they spotted a space object later called GD 165b. Despite having a lot of characteristics of a star itself, this celestial body was orbiting another star and didn't meet all the necessary requirements to get this title. That's why scientists started calling it a failed star. Seems kind of harsh now, doesn't it? Since that first discovery, astronomers have spotted more than 50 other brown dwarfs. And according to the latest estimates, there might be around 25 million failed stars in our galaxy alone. Because of the lack of visible light, brown dwarfs are very difficult to spot, so this number might be inaccurate, hmm, you think? The most typical reason why a star might fail is that it doesn't manage to gather enough material to start regular stellar fusion. Now back to Saturn. The answer to the question of whether this planet might be a failed star is no. Why? The main difference between a planet and a failed star is the way they form. Stars appear when dust and gas collapse in a primordial cloud. That's why they contain low amounts of metals. At the same time, planets have significantly less mass than stars. That's why they have much lower gravities. And one of the main reasons why Saturn isn't a failed star is that it didn't start its life with enough mass to get the status of a star. A brown dwarf accumulates its star material in a similar way a star does, rather than following the method planets use. Thanks to their high gravity, failed stars can easily hold on to relatively light elements, like helium and hydrogen. For Saturn to become a failed star, it would need to be 50 times its current mass. But even if the gas giant decided to go through with the plan of becoming a brown dwarf, there simply wouldn't be enough material orbiting the Sun for this to happen. Any of the gas giants in our solar system, Jupiter or Saturn, would need at least 10 to 15 times more material to grow into a failed star. Not something you'd normally aspire to. You see, the Sun contains around 99.86% of the mass of the entire solar system. So, even if you combined all other materials in our star system, it still wouldn't be enough to create a star, even a failed one. Brown dwarfs and regular stars have a lot in common. Both start their lives as giant balls of gas. Both have protostellar cores. All of them start nuclear reactions and produce a lot of heat. Many failed stars produce some light too, but it mostly lies in the infrared spectrum. Now, let's look at the differences between these kinds of stars. A regular star releases light and energy due to thermonuclear reactions going on in its core, converting hydrogen into lithium. But a failed star doesn't have the mass to achieve this. Plus, failed stars are much smaller than regular stars, which generally possess more than 80 times the mass of Jupiter. A regular star normally has a gravitational pull strong enough to form a solar system with planets orbiting around it. As for brown dwarfs, they often orbit other stars. There's only one known failed star with a planet orbiting it. And I'm curious, why did scientists call it a failed star? Seems sort of academically judgmental to me. Did it get an F on some exam? 
How about other labels? Disappointing star or came up short star. But I digress. Okay then, how about Jupiter? After all, this gas giant is larger than Saturn. In fact, it's the largest planet in the solar system. Plus, this planet and the Sun are basically made of the same stuff. Both are mostly composed of hydrogen and helium with traces of other chemicals and elements. But the Sun is over 1,000 times the mass of Jupiter. If you place these two space bodies side by side, the gas giant would look tiny next to our star. So what makeover would Jupiter need to undergo to turn into a star? If it wanted to be as large as our Sun, it would have to increase its mass by a factor of over 1,000. On the other hand, the Sun isn't the smallest or least massive star out there. There are red dwarfs, stars with the lowest mass. The smallest of them can be a mere 7.5% of the mass of the Sun. So if Jupiter was striving to be called a star, it would be much more realistic for it to become a red dwarf. In this case, it would have to increase its mass by a factor of 80 or so. Interestingly, there's a tiny star in the Milky Way galaxy which is smaller than Jupiter. This is a red dwarf about 36,660 miles across that lies 600 light-years away from Earth. It makes the red dwarf one of the smallest known stars capable of supporting hydrogen fusion. Okay, we figured out that neither Saturn nor Jupiter can be called a failed star. But what if these two gas giants collided? Would they merge into one gas giant, which would then turn into a brown dwarf? Of course, at the moment, we're unlikely to see Jupiter and Saturn collide, which is a good thing. But let's speak about a hypothetical situation and its consequences. So, some time ago, scientists were sure that Saturn and Jupiter played similar games. At some point in the past, both planets reached the stage where they needed to vacuum up tremendous amounts of material in a relatively short period of time. But apparently, Jupiter got luckier in the process. Still, according to some studies, Saturn never had a running chance. You see, the critical threshold where a planet can gain a huge amount of hydrogen and helium is about 100 times the mass of our planet. And Jupiter indeed easily beats it, which might mean that it managed to acquire the lion's share of material in the outer solar system before the Sun blew it away. Uranus and Neptune turned out to be far too small to take part in this race for power. As for Saturn, it's right in the transition zone. Had it been a bit bigger, it could have probably competed with Jupiter for the title of the largest planet in the solar system. But instead of fighting its main competitor, Saturn got stuck. It grew large enough to attract a significant amount of hydrogen and helium with the help of its gravitational pull. But it wasn't enough to kickstart the process of nuclear fusion and get going. It means that, despite all the similarities they share, Jupiter and Saturn evolved along totally different tracks. And if these two planets collided, they wouldn't merge into one planet, let alone a star. If it was a head-on collision, the planets would destroy each other. Their gas envelopes would be eliminated and the remains of their solid cores would be catapulted into the vacuum of the cosmos. But if the collision happened at an angle, the planets would probably survive it. But in both cases, the planets would lose a massive portion of their material. In one more collision scenario, the gas giants would simply slide across each other at an oblique angle. It would result in a change in their shapes, but wouldn't alter the composition or mass of the planets. Hmm. Can we call that a failed collision? How disappointing!